Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, I'm very excited about this series on the Romantic Manifesto by Ayn Rand. Um, I don't know where to start because I have my friends, Rob and Sherry here, uh, Joya and Maritza, you know, all of us have looked at this work and romanticism in art for a long time. And we normally talk about this, you know, when I visit Rob and Shuri, we can talk about this for hours very easily. And so it's, I'm very excited about how, what we can do with the stories. So what we're doing today is to give an introduction to Romantic Manifesto. What we are, we are I'm gonna start by asking the panels two sets of questions. The first question is what does Romantic Manifesto mean to you? And the second question is, what do you think is the place of, what does romanticism have to offer to today's culture? And where does romantic manifesto fit in Ayn Rand's work? Okay, so those are the two sets of questions that I'll be asking. Then the panelists would get a chance to ask, put one question on the table for the rest of the panel. And then I'm gonna open it up for questions from you. So if you have any questions, just go ahead and keep them ready or you can type them in chat um, already start with the exclamation mark. So I know that it's a question for the panel. But, so we'll do question and uh, Q and A, and then we're going to do breakout rooms so we can discuss what ideas that have been presented and then we'll come back to share our takeaways. So that's the format. So the first question on the table is, what does Romantic Manifesto mean to you? And we're going to start with Rob first, then Maritza, then Joya, and then Sherry. Rob. All right, so I, when I, you mentioned talking about the American Manifesto in general, the role of art in general, the first thing I thought is, well, we have to start with the boy and the bicycle scene. Mm -hmm. And for those who know the Fountainhead, because we talked about the Fountainhead earlier in the week, uh, for those who know the Fountainhead, this is a scene fairly late, the beginning of part four of the novel. Uh, uh, and it was really the passage where Ayn Rand very deliberately set out to write about the impact of art on an individual soul. And uh, I'm gonna just excerpt a little bit of the scene, but it's the very first chapter, very first scene in, in, in part four of the Fountainhead. Um, and what's happening here is that Howard Rourke has built the Menadnock uh, Valley, uh, it's this uh, resort, uh, like a vacation resort out in the country in Pennsylvania. And he's just finished building it. It's this giant masterwork that he's done. He's just finished building it. And it's, it's there empty and they're just putting the final touches on it. And there's a boy, a, a young man who comes- Don't call him a boy, he's well, a it's, college grad. It's, it's called the boy in the bicycle, but he's like 22. So you know, adjust your expectations. <laughs> but uh, he's, he's on a bicycle going through the countryside, has no idea this is there, comes over the rise of the hill and suddenly sees this. And this is describing what's going through his mind and the impact this has on him. So I'm just, it's a longer scene, but I didn't want to take so much time. So I'm going to read a few excerpts here. So it says, he was a very young man. He had just graduated from college in the spring of the year 1935, and he wanted to decide whether life was worth living. He did not know that this was the question in his mind. He did not, uh, he did not think of dying. He thought only that he wished to find joy and reason and meaning in life, and that none had been offered to him anywhere. He could not name the thing he wanted of life. He had always wanted to write music and he could, could give no other identity to the thing he sought. If you want to know what it is, he told himself, listen to the first phrases of Tchaikovsky's first concerto or the last movement of Rachmaninoff's second. Men have not found the words for it, nor the deed, nor the thought, but they have found the music. Let me see that in one single act of man on earth. Let me see it made real. All right, so then he comes over, over the crest of the hill and what he sees is, in the broad valley far below him, in the first sunlight of early morning, he saw a town. Only it was not a town. Towns did not look like that. He had to dispend, suspend the possible for a while longer, to seek no questions or explanations, only to look. Uh, there were very small, there were small houses on the ledges of the hill before him, flowing down to the bottom. He knew that the ledges had not been touched, that no artifice had altered the unplanned beauty of the graded steps. Yet some power had known how to build on these ledges in such a way that the houses became inevitable, and one could no longer imagine the hills as beautiful without them. 
as if the centuries and the series of chances that produced these ledges and the struggle of great blind forces had waited for their final expression, had been only a road to a goal. And the goal was these buildings, part of the hills, shaped by the hills, yet ruling them by giving them meaning. The houses were of plain fieldstone, like the rocks jutting from the green hillsides, and of glass, great sheets of glass used as if the sun were invited to complete the structures, sunlight becoming part of the masonry. There were many houses. They were small, they were cut off from one another, and no two of them were alike, but they were like variations on a single theme, like a symphony playing by, played by an inexhaustible imagination. And one could still hear the laughter of the forces that had been let loose on them, as if that force had run unrestrained, challenging itself to be spent, but had never reached its end. Music, he thought, the promise of the music he had invoked, the sense of it made real, there it was before his eyes. He did not see it, he heard it in chords. He thought that there was a common language of thought, sight, and sound. Was it mathematics? The discipline of reason. Music was mathematics and architecture was music and stone. He knew he was dizzy because this place below him could not be real. Uh, after a long time, he glanced about him and then he saw that he was not alone. Some steps away from him, a man sat on a boulder looking down at the valley. The man seemed absorbed in the sight and had not heard his approach. The man was tall and gaunt and had orange hair. He walked straight to the man who turned his eyes to him. The eyes were gray and calm. The boy knew suddenly that they felt the same thing and he could speak as he would not speak to a stranger anywhere else. This isn't real, is it? The boy asked, pointing down. Why, yes, it is now, the man answered. It's not a movie set or a trick of some kind. No, it's a summer resort. It's just been completed. It will be opened in a few weeks. Who built it? I did. What's your name? Howard Rourke. Thank you, said the boy. He knew that the steady eyes looking at him understood everything those two words had to cover. Howard Rourke inclined his head in acknowledgement. Wheeling his bicycle by his side, the boy took the narrow path down the slope of the hills of the valley and the houses below. Rourke looked after him. He had never seen the boy before and he would never see him again. He did not know that he had given someone the courage to face a lifetime. Right, so that's the end of uh, the scene. And right, so this is her writing about what the impact of art can be. And it also put me in mind of another, uh, um, another scene sort of on the opposite end of the spectrum, another scene in Atlas Shrugged. That's brutal. To I know to go from one to the one other. other. But if, for those oh. who know Atlas Shrugged, there's a scene late in the novel where um, Cheryl Taggart is in this sort of crisis uh, of, you know, her, her whole world, everything she thought about her world was true, is collapsing. She's in a moment of, spirit, of deep spiritual crisis. And she's running through the streets of New York City. And she turns around a corner. She looks down the street. And this is, you, you, we all had, had seen this, you know, late at night, the streets are empty. She sees a row of traffic lights over the street. And one after another, they turn from green to red. Boom, 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 going down the down the road and this is summing up really her 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 crisis her her psychological crisis that the like all the lights of the world are turning red telling her you know forward movement is impossible what you thought that you wanted out of life is impossible and that i think is sort of the antipode to this scene of the boy in the bicycle scene in the fountainhead of showing how uh this this now it's not so much a role of a work of art but more the idea of that having the opposite impact on your life of having this sense that nothing is possible, you're doomed. And uh, I kind of think that, you know, when we get into the issue of sense of life, which is, you know, as we get into the discussion, we'll talk about Ayn Rand's concept of sense of life. That's really what I think of sense of life as being is it's a series of green lights or red lights, uh, at least in, in one respect, uh, sense of life is a series of green lights or a series of red lights. A series of lights telling you, yes, you know, what you want is possible, go forward into life. You know, you can achieve what you want to achieve or a series of red lights telling you, no, it's all impossible, give up. And, uh, you know, this scene with the boy and the bicycle and seeing Manadnock, the Manadnock Resort that Howard Rourke has designed, this is his big green light uh, telling him, yes, you know, what you want out of life is possible. It's, it, it, somebody has actually done it, you can do it too. And, I think that indicates sort of the, that that's Ayn Rand trying to sum up what she sees as the power of art, what she's trying to accomplish in her novels. And 
gives us an idea of, of the importance of understanding art and understanding aesthetics and seeing how it is that we can get this affirmation, the sense of energy, the sense of the world being uh, open to us uh, and how we can understand how art gives us that. Excellent. Uh, Maritza, you're next. So then looking at the question, uh, what does romantic manifesto mean to me? I, I view it as an okay, as it were, you know, when I was younger, looking at something like the Romantic Manifesto or even some of Ayn Rand's other um, works, it gives a, it, it defines something that already existed within me, as it were. And for the Romantic Manifesto specifically, it's, it's the, it releases the concern of there existing a dichotomy between that which is structured and rational and, you know, in my mind, serious, and the more playful aspect of, you know, art and poetry or something. You know, I, I would go to these, you know, open mics to um, read some of my poetry, and I felt like a fraud. I'm like. Yeah, there's this mathematics person who's never taking any philosophy classes or really any literature classes, and I'm going to go read something. I hope nobody discovers what I do for real. And that was kind of my internal dialogue. But reading the, the Romantic Manifesto, you know, Ayn Rand tells us that it's just, it's, one cannot escape that we need a philosophy in life, right? And, and I, I believe that with every cell of my being, whether one's philosophy is one's religion or science or, or whatever one makes of it, we need something to believe in. And then she clarifies it even more by telling us that you can't, there, there, you can't make art without it having and being imbued with your own values. And as such, that's giving you your, you know, sense of what you're doing here. And when I view it in that manner, well then it suddenly makes perfect sense. And it seems like it, in my mind, it made it acceptable and natural that I have the right to this poem because I felt it needed written and I wrote it for myself with my own internal guiding principles. And as such, it's art. And yes, I am the analytical finance person making art. And um, I, I, I believe that it's a very simple concept, but it's also so vast and huge. We as human beings spend so much of our time having to reject a box that's placed upon us. And the Romantic Manifesto just very simply tells us, someone created this bit of art a painting, a novel, and they are presenting something that you potentially could strive to be. This is what they saw in you. And if you look closely, you'll see it in you as well. And if you don't, well, now you have something to strive forward because if it existed, for the artist, then the potential exists for it to exist within you. Um, now, you know, if we, we go a little deeper, she is actually explaining to us how, you know, it's a requirement for us to have art. And that's, you know, I, I think we'll tackle that perhaps in some of the other questions here today. 
but when looking at what it means to me specifically, it, um, it removes what would have been a potential contradiction for me. Thank you. Thanks, Marisa. So Choya, what does romantic manifesto mean to you? Thank you. I'm so glad Rob wanted to start with the boy on the bicycle story because the, when I first discovered Ayn Rand, I read Atlas Shrugged first, then The Fountainhead. So when I finally got to that passage about the boy and the bicycle, this was toward the end of my reading of her fiction, but it absolutely resonated with me because it put into words what I was experiencing reading these two books, reading Atlas Shrugged, reading The Fountainhead, seeing those characters, those heroes who were creators and innovators and filled their life with meaning, with joy, as she described it at the beginning of that passage. And I knew that these characters were fiction, but Ayn Rand is real. She had actually achieved this in her own work, in her writing of her two major novels. So from the very start, I became deeply interested in how did this real person, Ayn Rand, live this life that was very similar to what she portrayed in these novels with her heroes. When I finally discovered the Romantic Manifesto, it was a revelation in that it provided the analysis. So Maritza talked about the art and the analytical side. And so if the novels are Ayn Rand's art, where she portrays, I love Ayn Rand's word of the promise, the promise of what is possible, the promise of what life could be. And then in the Romantic Manifesto, this was written after she had done all of her writing, after a lifetime of being someone who had the responses to favorite artworks of her own. I think when Ayn Rand wrote The Boy and the Bicycle Passage, on the one hand, she was putting herself in the shoes of the boy. And I think what that boy felt was very similar to what Ayn Rand experienced reading, for example, Victor Hugo. And we're gonna see that in the Romantic Manifesto. We're gonna see how she responded to what romantic artists put out there. And then Ayn Rand was also in the shoes of Howard Rourke. And in the Romantic Manifesto, we get to see that deep analysis of how did she create these works? What was her thought process? And there's so much depth and richness of information, her ideas about art and even deeper about psychology. I'm really excited we're going to explore this because in a sense, I feel it's coming full circle to that first experience I had when I was just a young girl, not perhaps on a bicycle, but a young girl looking up to Ayn Rand and now having this experience to delve deeper into how did she do it? And hopefully it'll just be something else that as the boy on the bicycle took that inspiration and it, it gave him the courage to face a lifetime of the, the difficulties of creative work. I'm hoping that what we discuss in, in our conversations will help us to gather up even more courage as we face our own challenges as creators and innovators in our own lives. Thanks, Shoya. Sherry. Um, so for me, um, I think the Romantic Manifesto was probably the third Ayn Rand book that I wrote, that I read um, after The Fountainhead and then Atlas Shrugged. Um, and this goes back to what I said about The Fountainhead too. For me, um, this is my field, art and architecture and art and art history um, and aesthetics is really my daily bread and butter. Um, so it's in, for me, it's very much a user manual. Um, it's like trying to be a, a baker, a pastry chef without knowing exactly what adding sugar to your dough does. You know, you don't, you have to understand the ingredients and what the ingredients do to your final product. And so for me, it's really, that is what this, this is, this manifesto does that no other treatise on art or painting or architecture or sculpture or music, no other treatise throughout art and architectural history gets to this level of depth 
they don't ever understand it to the level that she does. So it is extremely powerful to be able to essentially hold, understand and hold on to those tools so that you can use them really to make a huge difference in your own personal life. Because we've all talked about this, Rob's just mentioned it in this boy in the bicycle scene. We've probably all had an experience um, of a profound impact in a work of art, painting, music, sculpture, architecture, a book perhaps. <laughs> Uh, a novel perhaps that had that huge impact for you. Um, this book allows you to understand not just that it has that impact, but how that impact was created. So it's a hugely powerful tool for me. Oh, and Rob keeps telling me, um, for me, obviously, as an architect, she doesn't cover architecture to the depth um, in this book that she almost does in an implicit way in the Fountainhead through Rourke's work and through Cameron's work. Um, but I have read this book so much, you know, the cover has fallen off. Um, and when we came up with this idea of doing this, um, I opened it up to read it again for I don't know how many times I've read it. But the funny thing that happened is I opened up to this frontage page. I don't know if anybody can read. It's going to be backwards. Sorry. Anyway, you probably all have your own copies. It says the Romantic Manifesto. And then the subtitle is A Philosophy of Literature. And I had one of those head slap moments because I don't see <laughs> any longer as just a philosophy of literature. For me, it is her philosophy of aesthetics in general. Uh, the few points like in architecture where it's not as fleshed out as I personally wish she had done. <laughs> but, um, but that's, I think is, is, is a funny uh, side point that um, uh, she calls it her philosophy of literature, but she delves much deeper than that. It's beyond, I think she's underselling herself uh, with that subtitle. Um, did you want to say, did you want to? Well, the only thing I'd add to that is that uh, it actually, as I recall, as I understand, a lot of these actually came out of a series of lectures she gave mm. on literature. So that's, I think, why she called it that. Yep, yep. But go ahead. Um, the other really important thing, and the reason why I highly recommend a very, very deep digging down into this work is because having that understanding of what art can do in your life and being able to unravel those, the mysteries, to put reason behind those emotional reactions is it's so, so powerful for what it can do in your life. Um, the other day when Rob and I were driving around talking about getting together to talk about this, we brought up this idea of a guilty pleasure mm -hmm. reaction to art, maybe it's a book or a series of novels or something that you have this reaction that it's something about it you're drawn to that you like, but there's also something about it that repels you. And so you consider it a guilty pleasure. And as we were talking, we talked about how, you know, when you understand what she's teaching you in this book, you don't really have the guilty pleasures because you have the ability to rationally introspect and parse apart the parts that you're responding to something in a good way and in a, in, that you're drawn to maybe in a negative way. And you have that ability to change that when you can introspect at that level. Um, so it's in that way, it's almost a user manual again. Wonderful. Um, so this is definitely my favorite book, uh, nonfiction book by Ayn Rand by far, because just because what art is, firstly, because what art is, you know, art is basically a beacon. You know, what, what artists produces is, is a beacon of saying, this is what is possible. This is what can be and should be. Look, that's what the artist essentially does. Secondly, 
this is what Ayn Rand spent like her 50 years working towards. And this is her craft. And she's actually opening it up. As Sherry pointed out, she's showing you how it is done, how it is put together. What are the, you know, what is in what? So I want to step back and look at kind of the power of art itself. So let's start with, you know, Renaissance time. Imagine this statue of David standing not in the museum, but in the town square in Florence. In with a culture coming out of the Middle Ages, where the view of human beings is this abject, cowering beings, you know, beset by all this kind of, you know, world that they can't do much about. And humility is being the only thing that you can do. And there is, you know, there is this statue standing proud, confident, ready for action, um, you know, immensely capable and with full of courage. I mean, that is such a powerful contrast. Now, at that point, Michelangelo probably did not have the full words to describe what was going on, what kind of attitude that is needed to make this possible, what kind of worldview. So what art does is that art is the, it is concretization of philosophy. It takes all of philosophy and makes you feel it. It takes metaphysics, it takes epistemology, it takes ethics, all of that. And you can actually feel all aspects of it. What Ayn Rand does in Romantic Manifesto is that she shows you how this works. How is it that you look at something like David Take another example of works of Leonardo, who is one of, who is my favorite. The entire grandeur of what goes on in the mind of a human being, he's able to show in a static painting, all the movements as you move your eye, all kinds of stuff happens. So people are, you know, their general response is that of, this is mysterious. To produce that, of, to kind of show this is what is going on. This is the grandeur of a human consciousness. That's another, now these are both examples from visual art. But what art is doing is that um, art is showing you actually stuff across all these disciplines. It's saying, you know, take, you know, diff people, different artists have different views of what the world is like. They have different views of how the human mind works. They have different views of emotions. And what art does is that it actually brings all of that together. And what Ayn Rand is doing is that she's breaking all of that up to show you how it actually works in art. This is regarding, this impacts the, you know, the core views that we have about ourselves. You know, what should we do? How ambitious should be? What should we be? Uh, what is the world like? What is the proper interaction between people? And it all dramatizes and bring it, brings it home. And this book, Romantic Manifesto, is showing you how artists do that. And that's why you know it is my favorite book by Ayn Rand. Uh, sorry, second second round. Let's go to the next. Um, next level of questions, but what does romanticism have to offer to this question and, you know, or, or to, to this culture? And what does, uh, where does romantic manifesto fit in uh, Ayn Rand's work? So let's again, start with Rob. And this is, uh, Rob, this is a uh, flexible, you need to unmute yourself. This is flexible. You feel free to comment on anything else. These questions are just to get you started. Yeah, feel, feel free to ignore Sri Khan's promises. I, I did that anyway. Um, <laughs> no, actually, it's it's well. I used to. I I, I taught some communication things uh, years ago where I I told people and I used to use examples of this of how whatever question you get, you actually have your own agenda and you have your own idea of what it is that I want to communicate to people in this opportunity that I've gotten. I showed this example of uh, I think on some news show 
where a, a businessman was on and he was asked these questions and he could totally ignore the questions and he clearly had, this is the message I want to go out to the shareholders who are watching this business cable TV show. And <laughs> so you always have to have that attitude. Anyway, um, I actually wanted to follow up on something you just said. Is it possible to share the screen here? Because um, you were I mentioning- so. Yes, Dave. yes, you can do that. Yeah. Yes. You can, um, I'll let you navigate. Here. Oh, you want me to yeah. do it? I don't know where- uh, Click click on the- Yeah, but I don't know where- is uh, do, Start with there. Start sharing that. Okay. So Rob wants to show you a series of Davids. Yes. So can I- Oh, you have to hit that? share down here. All right. So, ah, there we go. Oh, excellent. Beautiful. Um, all right, so this is something that uh, a teacher- can, First of all, can everybody see these? Okay, yeah, good. Okay. Uh, I, one of my best teachers I had in high school did this and it blew my mind at the time. Uh, he did uh, four Davids and you can see three of them currently right here. Uh, these were all done in, uh, in, in Italy. Well, the three of them in Florence and one of them in Rome over a period of about 200 years. So early 1400s to early 1600s. And they sort of show this development. So let's, if you could foreground. Oh, let's see, you want this one. Yeah, just foreground. So this first one, we can bring over here, is Donatello's David. Now everybody knows the story of David and Goliath, right? So this is Goliath's, uh, move the cursor on it. That's Goliath's head. He's holding the sword. He's just killed Goliath. But the idea is, you know, David's just this little shepherd boy, and there's this nine foot tall giant he's going up against, and he, and he kills him. And uh, Notice that the, the shepherd boy here, it's, it's, he's very young. You can tell this, you know, the very, not a very sort of a softer body, not a lot of developed musculature. Yeah, like notice in the, in the, in the cat, in the, um, in the thigh muscles, it's really still soft, yeah. like, you know, a 13 like a, year old boy. I'd say this is more like a nine or 10 year old boy, like a 10 year old boy here. Um, and notice also, Sherry pointed out his hand, to, she pointed out to you earlier, who his hand is on his hip, but notice it's the, turned is turned to so the inside outside of the wrist is up against there and it's a and his pose is kind of languid so he's not he's not a very formidable character here uh, and then notice the sword on the other side with the fingers just loose around the hilt yeah so the next thing we go to is we go to verrocchio's david um I up here. I, I, this i have another version of it but i think this will here this will no this is okay so this is for, for, head on um this is Verrocchio's David. Again, Goliath's head down there. He's still got the, just slide that the sword. Oh, right. we, we, are, we are still seeing the first one. Oh, Oh, okay. So we close this one down. Yeah, we close this one out. Can you, oh. And now screen share again. Oh, okay, okay, got it. So uh, share screen. I see You need to works. pick this one. Okay, sorry, I haven't done this much before. All right, now you can see that one? Okay, we're good. All right, so this is the second David. This is like 50 or so years later. Second David, you can see this looks more like 12 to 15, 12, 14, 12 13, 14 year old boy. 18. Yeah, it depends. We're gonna argue. We're gonna argue about that. But you can see that there's a much more, especially in the arms, a much more defined musculature also in the rib cage and a much more confident stance. And notice where his hand is now. His hand is on his hip, but it is, you know, inward, it's a more confident and more strong and powerful looking. And notice also the way his his right hand is holding the sword, right? His, it's not- The thumb, the way the yeah, thumb is on there. Yeah, and so he's holding it in a much more active and powerful way. Then we go to, do we stop share and we go back to- I think you stop and then reshare the next one. Okay. Mm. Let's go to David. Let the, let, now, then we get to Michelangelo's David. And this is the one that the Florentines wait, wait for everybody to see it. Is it up yet? I think you need to close this one down. Uh, yes, it's good. Okay, I just doesn't show. You need up to here close this me. one. Yeah, down. I'll close that as well. All right, so we're at the Michelangelo's David, and uh, this is the one you know that the Florentines put outside of their uh, outside of their main government building. It became a symbol of Florence. It was actually I've heard some people say it was it was facing Rome. Because at the time, Florence was this you know, sort of small, scrappy republic that was facing off against the major power in Italy, which was Rome. So it was sort of meant to be their defiance of Rome, that they were the David and he was the Goliath. But notice, this is a fully grown musculature, uh, the, you know, how, how muscular the arm is, how big that hand is that's hanging down, uh, holding the stones that he's about to put in the sling. And there's a look of sort of, of, of fear, but also of calm resolve in his face. 
So it's clearly that you can see in this progression of David's in, 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 uh, in Florence that the sort of the growing sense of the stature and power of man and a growing, you know, that the, the Davids keep getting bigger and stronger and more confident as and we calmer, go along. And calmer. And, and more serene in a way, because that comes with the confidence, I think. And so we're getting much more of the sense of this, you can see the sort of the, the, the power of the Renaissance developing over a period of 100 years here, from the first David to the last one, of this sense of greater power and confidence and stature uh, that, that they had as a view of, 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 what, of what is possible to man. Now I'm going to go to the last one, which is a little bit go down the shore, about a hundred, almost a hundred years later. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, you should probably be down here. Yeah, this. right here. There we go. <laughs> All right, then here's the last one. This is Bernini's David uh, from Rome, uh, and you can see that, of course, this has gotten almost uh, as with most things re relating to Bernini, it's gone over the top. Right. Well, it's gone out of the Renaissance and into the time period at the very end of that. Yeah, yeah. So it's like 1600 and something, it's early 1600s. Uh, but, you know, I used to say he looks like Bruce Jenner, but that, that analogy doesn't work so well these days. Um, but you know, he, he looks like a, 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 not just a, a fully grown youth, but he looks like a top level athlete, very bulky and muscular. And with that grim determined set of the, of the jaw, uh, and the brow and that twisting motion that Bernini put into it. So you see that you know, the, the Davids keep getting bigger and stronger and more powerful and more vigorous. And that sort of, so let me stop sharing that. All right. And that sort of sums up to me the power of art to show what's going on in a culture. And it's showing the process of the Renaissance and the growing confidence and power of the Renaissance. Uh, Rob, let me let me do a small interruption uh, following your example. Uh, I want to point out one more thing about this sequence because this is a beautiful sequence. Um, you can see, again, one more thing about the power of art here. The last two are actually focused on the moment of decision mm -hmm. of fighting. So it is saying this. The first two were about yep. the result of it. And just showing, okay, this is what happened, okay? Whereas romanticism is all about the choice. You can actually see, uh, you know, I invite you to look at the details of the face of both these second statues. There is concern, there is courage. They are facing danger, there is determination and all of that. So they have chosen firstly the right point in the conflict of saying this is the turning point. And it is also showing you what is going on inside their mind. They're showing something about the consciousness, the kind of emotions, the kind of internal things that you need in order to produce the kind of effect of this giant being defeated by, by uh, a child. So that's, you know, that's, um, so I wanted to add that, that, you know, the, the progression of art is also kind of showing you, uh, kind of focusing on the kind of key points and focusing on inside. Go ahead. I actually prefer the Michelangelo version at the moment he's at. I think Bernini is too much, too excited with the action itself. And yes, yes. Turning it. You know, if mm -hmm. you see that in, 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 in real life, it's great because you walk around the Bernini one and, and it's, you know, there's so like much moving. Yeah, there's so much going on from so many different angles. I think we had Walter there as a oh yeah as a one and so, a half year old that he sure you can tell the story. Yeah, this is this uh, let me we'll get to what Rob was gonna say in a second here, but um this there's something I wanted to put in here if I can jump ahead of Julia Maritza um um on on this one um about what romanticism can offer, um, especially in, in Ayn Rand's book here. She talks about how, um, and Srikant was bringing this up too, this sense of life in a work of art has this um, instant, instantaneous emotional reaction for people. And um, it's quite often that children have those reactions to artwork more readily um, than us adults. We've learned to um, 
hold some of that in. Kids don't. Um, they just haven't had the skill developed yet. Um, so we had our eldest son um, with us in Rome when we were, well, we were in Florence and then in Rome. And he was with us when we went to see each of these. And um, he's a very, he, he was a very calm kid, did not like seeing, most kids don't, but he had a really serious reaction if there were, you know, another baby crying, he would crawling up the walls, I gotta get out of here kind of thing. Well, we took him into that gallery where Bernini's David was, and I physically could not hold him back from running away. <laughs> and then we finally calmed them down, brought them into another room in the space. And every time we came to another Bernini statue, it didn't matter if it was the one where there's the girl turning into a tree, didn't matter which one it was, or, or the king with the curls, it didn't matter. Whichever Bernini it was, the kid was out of there and it, it was too much for him. It was way too much emotion <laughs> for him all at once. It was physically too much for him. We literally paid tickets and didn't get to see anything in the gallery. <laughs> so, anyway, there's an example of the kind of reaction um, that if, if we let those happen, and maybe we won't all run out of the room, but um, that level of emotional response is really what you're looking for in a great work of art. And I think for some of us, we've, um, we've learned to shut off uh, those reactions um, to keep them quiet and privately to ourselves. This reminds me of the, the Joshua. Joshua yeah. Did anybody hear, hear about the, this is, I don't know, 15, 20 years 10 ago? 10 years ago, so. Joshua Bell, the, the uh, a famous violinist who did a uh, performance. The Washington playing, Post put him off to this stunt where he could go ahead. Yeah, he was playing in the DC subways. Um, and of course- You know, just like, you know, had his, like, like he's just a regular street musician. Yes, <laughs> with his case out, would be playing these virtuosity pieces and people would, you know, ignore him to go get on their train to their um, bureaucratic job in DC. <laughs> And, um, and he would play, you know, the piece that he played the previous week at some concert hall and would get, you know, steady innovation for people who just walked right by and ignored him, except for the kids, the little kids would, and maybe a handful of adults, the little kids would, would pull their parents or their caretakers and, and they, they'd have to be dragged away because they did not want to leave. Uh, what they were hearing, what they were hearing Joshua play. Um, but it's the same kind of, it's the same kind of reaction. Sherry, let me interrupt one more time yeah. because I, I think those uh, four Davids allow us to make a couple of more points. I mean, yes. one of the things you can see is how, what a culture, what a psychoepistemology of a culture is and how it is different. So for example, Renaissance, right? That is a turning point where people are discovering the power of a human being. What, what can human being do? So that has a kind of a freshness that has the focus on the critical, you know, critical point. It is, it is simple. Um, later on, it's, it becomes kind of more florid, whereas the kind of the core of the starting point gets lost. Before these, the other two, or if you go further back, if you, you know, Rob started kind of at the Renaissance time, but if you go to David's further back, yeah. those are going to be very different where people, can, you can barely kind of make out, is this actually, you know, it's like a painting of a person where people did not actually see human beings because they did not think that that was the right thing to do. You just were trying, they were like iconography, you know, that's like mm -hmm. showing, uh, showing as a depiction rather than actually seeing things. Go ahead. Uh, iconography, actually, the, a lot of the medieval art, one of the keys to understanding it, especially the Byzantine art, is that it was literally formulaic, that you mm -hmm. had a formula for here's how you portray the folds of the robe. And you, know, you learned, you make these shapes. So it was almost like a pictographic, you know, semi-pictographic mm -hmm. style of depiction where you weren't observing what a robes look like when they're, when they're draping mm -hmm. down over a human figure. You actually you don't you don't make that observation firsthand. You just memorize 
the standard sets of group of lines that you're supposed to make. Um, but we're talking about the psychopistemology of psychopistemology of a culture. And what I wanted to finish on, and I'll get out of the way and let other people talk, is um, three of those Davids I just showed you, you can see in Florence. But the other thing you can see in Florence, if it's available. Now, we saw this years ago, and I think they've done a renovation, so I'm hoping it's still available. They have something called the Vasari Corridor, and it's, it's basically it was just a long hallway, a super long hallway made so that the prince could go from the, the main government building to his palace across the river without having to mix with the, you know, the dirty, smelly people mm -hmm. down in the street. Without having to risk getting killed. Oh, without having killed. to risk getting assassinated, yes. <laughs> yes. But it was this long, long corridor and it goes through the offices, which are now the, literally Italian word for offices, Uffizi. So it's now the Uffizi Gallery. So it goes through, you know, one of the great art galleries in the world. They did a brilliant thing with this long corridor. They turned it into a special art gallery, at least the time when we saw it, they had a special art gallery that was devoted to the history of self-portraits, of artists' mm -hmm. self-portraits. And they do it chronologically. And it's fascinating to see how, because you get to see how the artist's view of himself and of his place in the culture changes. So at one point, the, the very first ones, in, uh, the artists looked like bricklayers and masons, and they're, they're just, they're tradesmen. They were. And uh, they're, they're blue collar knock around guys. Uh, then later on in the 17th century, they become courtiers wearing ribbons and the one guy portrays, paints himself with all the medals and awards he's been given. And in the, um, in the uh, uh, Enlightenment, the, the, the one guy shows himself out hiking out on the mountainside, hiking out in nature, observing nature. And he's dressed simply and he's a scientist out observing nature. And that's the artist's view of himself. And in the 19th century, of course, they're all looking. Let's see if I can summon this up. Okay, they're all looking. Wait. Get close to the screen. They're all they're all looking at you like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're all like burning with this fire of of uh, emo you know, they, have, they they have these burning deep black eyes and they're they're tortured souls looking out at you. You know, think George, think uh, Lord Byron, kind of. Yeah. You know, that was the model for the artist, and they all looked at you like Good that. Good job, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then, but the fascinating thing that happens though, is when you get to the 20th century, the artist disappears. Mm. That as you get into the, um, the modernists and the, uh, into the, mostly into the, as you get out of the impressionists into the modernists, the artist becomes unrecognizable and the whole thing ends because artists don't do self, you know, is Kandinsky going to do a self-portrait? You couldn't <laughs> yeah. tell it apart from yeah. the other thing. Exactly. So you, the artist becomes incapable of portraying even himself and sort of the artist sort of disappears and I think that that's the the role that we talk about the relevance of Romantic Manifesto to today is that to a large extent art or at least highbrow art has disappeared and Ayn Rand talks about this very in with sometimes in a sort of bitter way but it's something that she saw happening in, in real time that that uh, art disappeared from the culture and you know I can see it today because you know what you have is um, you know, I, I sort of work in the middle, what you might call the middle brow media, uh, you know, these the public, online publications and magazines and things like that, which are for intelligent college educated people. And all of their articles on art are basically about pop culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the heights of the culture that, that Ayn Rand talks about in, in, 20, in the 19th century have kind of disappeared from the public imagination and from the public discussion. And uh, I think that you know, the idea of bringing that back and reviving that. Now, I've, I've got a few examples of things that have happened that have revived it to some extent, but I'll, which we'll get to later, so I think they'll be relevant when we get into the book. On the other but, pages, yeah. Um, All but right. I think that's the real relevance of for today. Uh, excellent. I just want to make one more comment. Uh, I think this this idea, I mean, this is one of the core things Ayn Rand was trying to do. The Belle Epoque, the, the time, you know, late 19th century, the kind of sense of life, the way people felt about human potentiality was something unique and the art expressed that fully. And one of the complaints that Ayn Rand had is that that was completely lost after the two world wars, you know, first world war and the second world war. So it is, people do not actually even see that. So one of the things that romanticism does and what Romantic Manifesto hopefully will do for you is to give a sense of what is, you know, what does that even look like? All right, so with that delightful detour into uh, a museum, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Marisa. Marisa, go ahead, sorry about the delay, but it was worth it. Oh man, I gotta go after that. 
All right. Um, when looking at the question of what does Rome, you know, romanticism and art have to offer in today's current culture, um, I think of, well, first, let's remember, you know, what historically romanticism is. You know, it was art that emphasized emotional self-awareness and intense personal expression. And we actually got to see that just recently here in the um, images presented. So Ayn Rand tells us the mind leads, emotions follow. I find in today's culture, what we see more often is huge amounts of propaganda trying to be art that are telling us your emotions are gonna lead you and then uh, your mind might come along for the ride. I feel like that is what we are seeing over and over and how can we hope? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, so the, what we need today is we need to see things that are telling us this, this that you see here, this is the essential nature of humans. This is what it is. And you know what? You're a human. And because you are a human, this can be you. And that's what romanticism art can bring us. It's, it's that well-developed Michelangelo that is in peak form and, you know, prowess and doesn't need to be a giant to tackle and win against a giant. It gives everyone who looks in a mirror and sees themselves as potentially maybe too small or too insignificant or whatever questing that they're doing within themselves. In today, we have a lot of lost people and they're lost because we don't have enough art that is saying, this is the ideal. Look towards this, use this as your compass and you will find your way. You can be this. There's just not enough of that in today's world. And it, there's not enough that's causing a requirement for thinking either. And I believe those two go hand in hand because if one is working towards one's ideal, in my mind, there is a requirement for thinking to happen along the way. And if we get stuck looking at so much of the propaganda that is a cheap facsimile for art today, then the mind shuts down and the mind does not lead. And then you, you get nowhere and we're doomed. I really, I believe that that is, I mean, I, Ayn Rand says it maybe a little bit softer, but I do believe she does make the point that, you know, we, we cannot exist without art. And I find that to be true and that's, but not just any art, art that says this, you can be this. Thank you. Wow. That was wonderful, uh, Marisa. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Uh, Joya. I want to start by thanking Sherry and Rob for giving us a trip to Italy and, and showing us all of the great works. And one of the things you made me realize about myself is how much I really do love all artwork of all different styles because of what art is. The way I see it, art portrays to us what is important to an artist or the culture they were a part of. It gives us, as Srikant was pointing out, in that concrete, really visceral sense, what was their worldview? What was important to them? And for me personally, I love engaging with artworks of all forms and all styles. To me, it's a kind of empathetic process. It's a way of being able to put yourself into the circumstances of other people throughout different cultures, throughout different times, and seeing what it was that really mattered to them. 
And for me, it just gives me a broader sense of what human beings are, what it has been to be a human being and what has mattered to human beings throughout time and space. And so in that sense, I love all artwork, but I do think romantic art does something very special. As Marissa was pointing out, precisely because it does hold up what is possible and because it makes a point to show you what is good and what you can and ought to strive for. I think it's interesting in, in our current culture, my evaluation would be we have lots of superheroes and we have lots of antiheroes in the art of the popular culture. But romanticism suggests that we ought to focus on actual heroes. Ayn Rand referred to her style of art as romantic realism what could be and what ought to be. Holding up a vision of what it is a human being can be. And like Maritza, I think that does definitely involve being a thinker, it's, so that aspect of it, and then combining it with the rich emotion and holding up this vision of what is possible for human beings. That I think is the promise that romanticism holds for us. Thanks, Joya. Sherry? Um, I'm going to take Rob's um, idea of uh, taking the question and going sideways with it. <laughs> Besides, I think I sort of answered question two. I, I may have created a monster. You did that, create yeah. a monster. But, um, but Rob is used to you taking his stuff anyway, so. Well, I mean, you know, he takes mine too, because a lot of what he just talked about was actually mine. Oh, wow. <laughs> anyway, we share. Um, anyway, one of the things that I wanted to really mention um, is from the introduction of the Romantic Manifesto, uh, just a two or three page introduction here. But she brings up this uh, idea of a sense of life um, that um, and she, she mentions it in her introduction in a way that um, has been taken a couple of different ways. Um, she mentions a sense of life um, as, as a, a philosophy, uh, as it's coming from the philosophy. But what I think is really important to understand here is that is two levels of that. You have your explicit philosophy that is you'd get that in one of her other uh, nonfiction works or her fiction works too, but it's a top down, it's explicitly understood and accepted philosophy with a sense of life that she's talking about is an implicit philosophy. It's your emotional reaction of a lifetime of events and your association of those events, your a reaction, emotional reaction to those events, those things are built up really from the bottom up. They gather almost like silt on the bottom of the ocean. And that's where some of your implicit philosophy comes from. Um, and one of the really important things to know throughout art history and the history of mankind is that quite often, you will find the artwork comes before, the artwork that shows a, a philosophy, an implicit philosophy, it'll come actually before the explicit philosophy comes. So in sometimes when you'll read, especially in the introduction of her um, romantic manifesto, she, uh, it, you, it feels a little bit like you're listening to Dominique, if you get the reference for those of you that are really familiar with her work, um, there is a little of that. And you remember that she's, when you're, when you're thinking that, remember she's writing this towards the end of her career. Um, and, and she's seen that all of the heroes, Hugo and things like this of her youth are in her mind all but forgotten. Um, but the art often comes before the explicit philosophy. And one of the really inspiring things is just shortly after her death, Hugo's work, Les Mis, becomes a complete worldwide smash hit. She never saw that happen. So you gotta remember when you're reading her 
and 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 it feels like she's in a bad mood <laughs> give her a little bit of slack because there are things and and then and when you're thinking that that we're doomed remember um the culture is is all those individuals there's there's maybe the popular culture is very much turned away from the type of art that you may respond to or they may be absolutely against it and trying to, to trash it and and considering it evil and things like that but throughout all of that when and, and there's always individuals that are doing really fascinating really amazing things and today we have such a I mean right now we're talking to people from all across the world some of us it's almost dinner time some of us are still having our morning coffee there's so much more interconnectivity, so much more option to get out and find those deeply profound works of art that you might not have before. Because if you were in a little medieval town, the only artwork you got is whoever was playing the mandolin on the street corner and whatever artworks were hanging in the cathedral. <laughs> That's all you had. Um, so it's a much more positive there's, there's much more positive options out there. So we have to make sure we don't think of it in too much of a negative way. Wonderful, wonderful point, Sherry. So folks, um, so what we're going to do is that the panelists get to ask one question to the panel, and then uh, you get to ask questions. So go ahead and put your questions in the chat. I'll put an exclamation mark for, you know, before the question. Make your question count, ask the most the deepest question that you can possibly ask. Okay, so uh, while while the panelists ask the question, so who would like to put a question on the table amongst the panelists? So Joya, Maritza, Sherry, or Rob? Well, Rob had a question, I remember, and, and then I have a question too. Oh, you Rob should to go before, first. All right. Which one? Uh, well, I was going to say, I yeah, started with this boy, boy in the bicycle scene where the this profound impact uh, that uh, a work of art can have in you. I wanted to sort of ask other members of the panel, and also maybe for later ask people listening here to think in terms of your mind, what, what can you recall in your own experience was a work of art that had that kind of impact on you, uh, possibly even a life-changing impact on you, uh, or something that's, that really strongly shaped who you are and who you became? You stole my question. That was your question? <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> I'll come up with another I one. think Virginia is a community property state. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Mar so uh, Marisa or Joya, would you like to answer that? To answer it or to ask our own question? No, uh, let's first answer the question, uh, Rob's question, and then you get to ask, you, you are the next one who gets to ask questions. Well, I so, think I, um, I, was, I think I, I kind of already answered in, in my first response and that for me, the, the work that had that, that impact on me was in fact Ayn Rand's work. I, I read Atlas Shrugged first, so that's the one I would say that that was the work that that absolutely changed my life and who I, I've become. Okay. But I wanted to ask a question that even draws on that. I'd be curious to dig deeper once people have thought about perhaps a specific work that had an impact on them. As Sherry was pointing out, sometimes we have that strong emotional intuitive reaction first and then it's the analytical part that comes later. I'd be curious once you think about what work gave you that response, if you then can maybe start to put into words and say what it was about that work that drew you or, or what was the reason that you think you had that profound response to that work. Okay. Um... Marisa, do you want to answer either of the questions? Yes. Um, so what comes to mind for me is a childhood book. Um, it's, I believe it's more popular now because they made a movie of it, but um, it's called The Bridge to Tarabithia. And what, and I remember, now it's been ages since I've read it, but in my mind, I viewed this book and this was childish mind now, so I'm, I'm prefacing that. I've not read it as an adult, so I, I am left with the impressions I had as a child reading it. And as a child, I found the characters in that book to be 
almost inhuman in the integrity that they showed or uh, and in moving forward. And so to me, that's, that's one of the, the earliest examples I can think of something I would have classified a work of art. And maybe it seems almost silly to think of it in a child novel, but it stood out as different from all of the other. And that's actually, incidentally, it's one of the last books that I read as a, like on the child level, because I was a voracious reader and um, I was having trouble with the childlike, the overly childlike nature of children's books that didn't seem to have very well-defined plots to me. So this book here was like my, it was kind of the last straw for me. It, it gave me an example so clear to me in my childlike mind that I just, I had to graduate to more, you know, a concrete novels as it were. And um, so, so that was, that would be the, the first, I would say work of art that I, I can think of to me. So for me, um, I see, I think for different people, different forms of art speak more or less. So for example, for me, music is number one, second is visual arts and literature is third. Um, I think for different people, it is different. So for me, uh, and what has happened is that at different points in my life, different arts have kind of pieces of art have taken me to a new level. She kind of showed me a new level. So Leonardo's uh, paintings have had a profound impact on me. Um, and it just showed me what is possible. And then reading all his notebooks about how he did it, of basically how he talks about what goes on in the mind when you look at something, especially from a artist perspective of making something or you know drawing something. So his entire ideas about how to see have completely transformed uh, you know my thinking. Um, and then uh, for music, it is Beethoven's Fifth. Uh, there was a point I'd listened to it so much and that I could sing the whole thing. I could not not all the instruments at once, but the main line I was able to sing. So it is. Um, I, I don't know how to sing multiple instruments. Unfortunately, my my voice is very limited um, at, at the same time. So. So those, those two have been uh, the most influential. What about you, Robin, Shari? Um, that's a tough one for me because um, there's, there's certain, there's so many different levels. Um, it, are you, th you asking an individual, individual fields work of art because other, otherwise you're asking too many questions all at once. Um, take, take, take Rob's question. Basically, yeah. A boy in the basketball experience, he picked any field of art. There, yeah, there was, it was, there is one particular sculpture that I think maybe when we're further down the road, um, I would love to, uh, go into a very detailed uh, observation of it, essentially walk around the piece with you all um, after we've kind of learned a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and that is uh, Sandra Shaw's work, Michelangelo, which I am lucky enough to own uh, one of her copies of it or one of her uh, uh, castings of it. And it's in my living room. And um, maybe what we could do once uh, towards the end of our 12 part series here is we could set it up and, it was, and light it properly and uh, use the computer screen to walk around and so that we can all sort of view it at once because then I can really explain what it means and why um, for me. Um, but in other art forms, Chopin, um, most of his nocturnes, uh, some of his waltzes are uh, a deeply profound um, response to um, the funny thing that if I look back to my uh, childhood, um, people who know me, uh, who see me as a, a very generally happy, positive person are usually shocked to discover that I was a huge fan of Edgar Allan Poe as a kid. Um, 
And one of the benefits of um, understanding how and why art works, I was able to piece apart um, introspection, it is a wonderful thing, to piece apart that the thing that I really loved about reading Edgar Allan Poe was his descriptions of the rooms and the environments where his stories take place were so visual, they created such a picture in my head that it, um, and so knowing that I'm an architect that you can kind of understand why that was such a big deal for me, um, that that was why I loved his work. I would read it so that I could have that experience of reading the words and having a space develop in my head like it was in a, like I was stepping into a movie scene. Um, so, yeah, there's uh, many, many others. I could go, we no, could just I could do that for hours. I don't <laughs> think that's fair. So Rob, can you answer your question that you stole from Sherry? Well, yeah. I, I had two options for this. One, I was going to mention Les Miserables because the musical came out in 85. I saw it when I was a freshman in college. It was out when it was making its first big US tour. I'm going to table that though, because I think there's going to be a big, big opportunity later on in this discussion to talk about Victor Hugo mm -hmm. and, and that in particular. Um, the other thing I was going to say something earlier, though, that I sort of almost, you know, before I discovered Ayn Rand and not related to that in any way, is my dad had a, um, uh, you know, LPs, vinyl, uh, Does had anybody a, know a what four are? LP collection of called Pavarotti's Greatest Hits. So it was like the, the, the top recordings of Luciano Pavarotti from when he first made himself famous in household world in the late 70s. And he had this collection. And I remember the one I listened to was, uh, I, used to, I used to listen to that. And the one that really blew me away was Nessun Dorma from Turandot. And it's this, just, it's this sort of anthem of triumph. And it was only years later that I discovered what the lyrics were about and the role it plays in the story. And it gets even better if you understand mm -hmm. the role it plays in the story. But it was this sort of anthem of triumph ending on this you know, magnificent high note that you know, only Luciano Pavarotti could could hit in such a full and powerful way and sustain for so long. Uh, and that was one of the things that I think had a really huge impact on me when I was when I was like 15, 16 years old. Uh, wonderful. So now let's do one thing. Uh, there are lots of uh, in questions lined up from the audience. Yeah. So let's go to the audience questions. Um, and then we're going to do uh, breakout rooms and then takeaways. Um, Jonathan, you're first, go ahead. Uh, give me just a second. Let me go ahead and enable that. Uh, yes, Jonathan, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just wondering what are your thoughts on to anyone on the panel or specifically, um, was it Rob, Rob and Sherry? Mm -hmm. um, what do you think uh, the boy on the bicycle would have been like if you didn't see the art versus the boy on the bicycle who saw the art? Oh, interesting. That's an interesting mm -hmm. speculation. What, what, what would have happened to him if he hadn't seen oh. that? Now, you yeah. know, you could always pause that. Well, maybe he would have seen something else. You know, there's, there's maybe would have been an art museum in uh, Philadelphia and uh, seen, you know, one of, these, one of these great works by the 19th century romantics and had the same experience. But I think that, you know, what if he hadn't had that experience? Well, I think he would have become like the stereotypical angry young man uh, from the literature at the time. You know, the, the, someone who, or it was sort of a cliche of, the, of movies in the 50s, the angry young man uh, uh, who is uh, sort of angry at the world and bitter about the world because he doesn't know what he's supposed to be doing and, and what he's supposed to be living for and, and has... Uh, you know, has that that's turned into anger or bitterness? So it's a real interesting question. What would have happened to him? It's kind of left open to us. You have I'm I'm going to read just uh, two lines from um, the introduction to the Romantic Manifesto, and uh, Rob will have to read it if I can't get it all the way through it. <laughs> um, they had given it up, and along with it, they had given up everything that makes life worth living: conviction, purpose, values, future. They were drained, embittered hulks, whimpering occasionally about the hopelessness of life. I also think maybe in The Fountainhead, she kind of gives an answer to this too, which goes, she shows you Stephen Mallory, the sculptor, mm. when work first discovers him. And he's this brilliant sculptor who's being ignored. And he's kind of, you know, bewildered and uh, lost in life because of that. I think actually Ayn Rand 
shows us that over and over in many characters. We mm. see it in different levels. Um, yeah, you, you see Cameron, you see Mallory, you see Cheryl Taggart. That's mm -hmm. sad. Um, you even see, uh, oh, I'm not going to give any spoilers. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you see it over and over. And then in some cases, like, okay, that's another spoiler. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you, if you look for it, you'll see that she is showing you, I think it's a special um, issue for Ayn Rand yeah, that she team. needed to show all the different variations of that, of people being broken down and exhausted by um, of the world around them. And then they'll see one spot. They'll see one piece. You see um, D Dagny walks through the Taggart terminal and she sees the statue of her grandfather, great grandfather. Great -grandfather. Um, you know, so I think it's a special thing for her that she, she has moments um, in many, many characters uh, throughout all of her novels where these, they come to this point and they either have a work of art or a response or they hear a piece of music on a train uh, <laughs> that does that out that gives them that fuel or it's it's something that that's like the little red lights for Cheryl all the way down the road lights turning red and then mm. it's the hopelessness of it all I just want to add one thing about cultures you know Ayn Rand grew up in Russia mm. um, when it was very very rough there and the entire culture is kind of toxic to life yeah. and the kind of the theme of we the living, you know, what actually keeps you living in that situation? You know, what kind of beacons, you know, whether it is, you know, possibility that there is America, something out there, uh, a concrete thing or, or art or another person who has that untouched soul in them. Um, so I think, I think uh, you know, it's, it's a it's a profound it's excellent question and uh, you know profound issue. Next up is uh, Tova, Joe, and Lloyd. Tova. Yeah, I just was wondering if like um, you just brought off. Brought uh, off. Tova, could you could you speak closer to the? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know you just brought up like, um, a, like a more historical perspective on trying to understand what is um, and where are her limitations or um, what are her understandings of um, art because of those limitations. So I guess in, in that, um, I was wondering if um, you thought that she had the right to qualify what is art and what is not art like as valid or invalid forms, AKA photography being not uh, valid because it's merely, you know, just another eye to, you know, see what it is that we see. Um, if she had the right to do that, um, or if she was just being like almost repeating totalitarian um, standards that were imposed on her within her own theory. Um, if I may jump in here, I so in in an interview that I, I heard once, where Ayn Rand was was being interviewed, she was asked something very similar, and what she clarified was that naturalistic art is incomplete, not necessarily invalid, but it's incomplete. So if you take a snapshot, you are just capturing what is. Um, she views true art to be a reflection of what ought to be or what could be. And um, that's, that's where she gets. So she's not necessarily dictating what is or is not art. She is specifying that there is value in romantic art that is lacking in other forms of art. Because she did acknowledge that you know, various forms of art do exist, but she's looking specifically at this style because this style is the one that elevates the thinking, rational sense of self. Can I jump in that I, this is actually one area where I disagree with Ayn Rand, where she said that she didn't see photography as an art similar to um, painting, something like that, because 
right? It was, you, you're, you're copying something that exists in life. You're not uh, doing it selectively. You're not recreating it according to your view. I, I actually disagree with that because I think that that she was underestimating the amount of selectivity that mm -hmm. comes in photography. And I'm sure Sherry can talk more about yeah, this. Yeah, we've, we've had this conversation <laughs> this, many times. I'm stealing over her ideas again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the big, main thing I wanted to say is that, you know, um, anybody who, there are some people who will sort of take Ayn Rand, or Ayn Rand said this was true, therefore it's, therefore it's true, and you can't possibly disagree with it. And you, you always have to remember, Ayn Rand is also the same person who wrote The Character of Howard Rourke and The Fountainhead. You know, she wanted you to be an independent thinker and, uh, and, to, and to disagree with her if necessary. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's one case where I think she uh, was underestimating what could be done in photography. I think actually it's quite possible that um, given the time that she had made that comment, um, it wasn't the ability as a, a photographer to make as many uh, value judgments, choices in making a, 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 a photograph. Um, these days, we really know that there is many, many details that a photographer has within their capability of what they're creating in that image. Um, whether it's the time of day that you take the picture, the weather, the camera you're using, the film, if you're, you know, at that eight, that time of, 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 of the world where you actually used film. <laughs> uh, you know, there's so many different things. There are a, a, an enormous number of details that go into creating a photograph um, that I, I think it's, it's, it's definitely a possibility. There's a couple of other things like music Music is a little bit different form of art. Um, that's probably another topic we should get into. It almost has like a, 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 a straight portal to your emotions almost. Architecture is, you know, she talks about art. Uh, it, it's, it has its, its purpose is for contemplation, but obviously architecture is the building, uh, is to house things. Uh, to, you know, to provide protection or something. So there's a, there's a lot of little elements around and outside of it. And then this gets back to what I said earlier. We have to keep in mind, she was writing this as a series of lectures about fiction writing. Um, she, I think if she had delved into photography a lot, um, she would uh, clearly recognize the number of value choices the photographer makes when making an image. Thanks, Sherry. Next up is Joe. Hi. Um, thank you, everybody, for presenting, because it was a wonderful presentation. It was really eye-opening and opened my mind a lot. Uh, one of the things is that the idea that art and you know science and how these things work together and how it expands our imaginations and allows us to think what it, you know what is possible uh, what is the distinguishing characteristic between Ayn Rand and say maybe like an Immanuel Kant or somebody who's also spoken about art at a, you know, at a, a, a you know, a very uh, detailed level. What is beautiful? What are aesthetics? And, you know, what, what is really distinguishing her from past philosophers? You know, I, I'm sold on reading the Roman. I'm definitely going to, to uh, take advantage of reading more of Ayn Rand, but I, I do, you know, this is not the first time we're hearing the link between art and imagination. Mm -hmm. So, um, Joe, Joe, let me go ahead and uh, kind of expand the question. So where does Ayn Rand fit in the history of aesthetics? And, you know, what, what are the different views on aesthetics and where does he, she fit in? I'll jump in and say, first of all, she has a unique, she comes up with a unique definition of art, which I, I believe it comes up in the first chapter, but she's going to define art as a recreation of reality based on an artist's metaphysical value judgments. So with that, we're, I, I, don't, I don't think we wanna get into that right yet today, but maybe that's a teaser for our, our upcoming discussions to even unpack what that quite wordy statement really means. But the teaser perhaps suggests that she does have this unique perspective first on what art is broadly. And then I think she also has a unique perspective on what romanticism is. She has a, she has a, a unique angle in, in defining what makes a work of art romantic as well. So just within 
in, within those spheres, I think she already has something valuable to offer. And my take on it is I think she really delves into the psychology that's behind both the creation and the appreciation of artworks. But I feel like I don't want to say too much because it's what we're, we, we're going to need 12 weeks to explore. Mm -hmm. um, if, I could, if I could just jump in briefly, because you asked about Immanuel Kant, and I've actually read Kant's aesthetics. Um, congratulate me on my bravery. Kant is, is one of those, uh, I like to say Kant is one of those philosophers who should be read only by a trained professional with proper medical supervision. Uh, he's, he's famously obscure and, a, and, and, you know, complicated way of, of saying things. You have to really sort of decode it out of the, out of the hieroglyphics in which he speaks. Uh, but basically, it would be just very, very, very brief idea of what Kant had to say. He, he was basically the father of modern art. Uh, because he had this idea that, well, it's the interplay of patterns and shapes that is important and not what you're portraying in art. So, and he was thinking, thinking talking specifically about, about painting, that it's not the person or landscape or still life that you're actually, the things that you're actually showing that are important. What's important is the patterns of light and shade and color and, the, and, and that you get pleasure and joy just from the sheer patterns of light and color on the perceptual level. Now, the interesting thing is that by the time this gets put into practice, it's called abstract art, but he's actually saying, he's actually reduced art purely to the perceptual level, to patterns. Uh, and so when you get to somebody like uh, Piet Mondrian, who does these things, there are all these uh, grids of colors, of squares of different colors, uh, or Kandinsky, who's just, you know, or, or Jack the Dripper, um, <laughs> Uh, Jack Jackson Pollock, who does, you know, just drips of, of, of paint on the canvas. That's the full implementation of what Kant is saying, that it's really just, it's just the drips of paint is the, the patterns of, of color and texture on the, on, that you're looking at. And that's the only thing that's important. And what you're portraying as, you know, basically representationalism in art, actually representing a human figure or a landscape or something like that, that's all irrelevant and unimportant and that's shallow. And you can see how when you take out the representationalism, when you make art no longer about the world and about people, you're no longer showing a human figure or the kind of world in which a human lives or something like that, you're, t you're, you're taking out, you're basically hollowing out most of the content of art because you're no longer saying something about human life or about human choices or about what kind of people are, what kind of people are living and what kind of world they're living in. You're no longer saying any of that. You've taken away all the biggest and most emotionally powerful uh, uh, issues that you could be dealing with in art. And so Kant is, you know, I think the, uh, she is really an antipode to his aesthetics as she's an antipode to him. It's kind of, there's a, a symmetry between them that she's in almost every issue they are antipodes. Next up is going to be Lloyd, Kevin, David, and Jonathan. Lloyd? Lloyd, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, next one is Kevin. Right. Go ahead. Uh, no, I'm good. I'm good. Can I go? Go yeah. ahead. All right, thanks. Um, I, uh, let's see. Well, Sigmund Freud, uh, I know, positing uh, the unconscious, you know, in his writings, uh, did influence a lot of artists. And uh, one artist that I, I like. Well, folks, uh, folks uh, just, uh, just a reminder. Okay, we have four, four rules. Um, one is you type an exclamation mark to speak. Uh, to speak. Some second rule is to keep on topic. Third is be brief, and uh, fourth is feel free to disagree with any anybody on anything and do so courteously. So Lloyd, please be brief. Go ahead. Okay, sure. Um, one artist that I like uh, quite a bit is Salvador Dali, mm -hmm. and uh, Dali, it seems to me, doesn't try to. Uh, elevate the human spirit or idealize basically the unconscious is what he was trying to capture uh dripping clocks uh flaming giraffes a uh, picture of lenin on a keyboard uh, a piano being uh, pulled apart and sort of disappearing at the same time um so i guess the question would be it would be unfortunate if uh, there was no Salvador Dali, in my opinion, because I've enjoyed his art. Um, in, in Ayn Rand's world, would there be room for someone exploring the irrational and the, and the unconscious mind like Salvador Dali? 
Um, I think I think there's one one thing that I, I was thinking when Rob was talking about Kant and, and the previous question too. Um, there's one thing throughout art history that we have to keep in mind uh, that ties into Salvador Dali. Um, art history moves, it, art itself changes throughout time based on all sorts of different things. Sometimes it's philosophy, sometimes it's this general sense of life reaction of a culture that brings about something. Um, but when we get to the modern era, um, modern being 19th century forward, we're starting to find that there's science where people are starting to research the human mind and the way it works. Um, and some of those early understandings, those early um, scientific discoveries about the way the brain works inspires some of these artists like Salvador Dali, like um, it's, it's based on Sigmund Freud's research, uh, which has since been proven wrong. But at the time, they thought this was the most current scientific information. And then so art would blossom with that sort of field in mind. Um, one example I always like to mention, it sometimes comes from um, changes in art can happen from changes in technology. So when the impressionists, which we all, I, I say impressionists, every one of you has got a picture in your head, right? Um, and that field, that change in art came along because paint for the first time was manufactured. You didn't have to make it yourself in a studio. You could take it in this little tube out into the world, <laughs> sit in the grass and paint but then the light changed so rapidly that you needed to paint something really fast to catch the way the light was at that moment. Mm -hmm. So impressionist paintings really come about from that too. So what you're responding to, it, 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 don't think that it's, um, that, it, that it's somehow bad because you're responding to it. You shouldn't ever come to it from that. You should use that as a way of saying, okay, let me think about that through these 12 chapters and discover what it is emotionally that I'm responding to because I'll get even more value out of it when I understand where my reaction is coming from. I think she actually talks about Dolly in one of these chapters. She may. Yeah, I, it's worth pointing out, her favorite painting was Dali's crucifixion. So I think she would agree with you, Lloyd, that uh, the world would be a much better place without Dali's painting in it. Yeah. Uh, well, the other thing I will also mention is Dali reminds me of uh, just one might have, what Dali oh. reminds me of that other crazy Spanish guy who did the Sagrada Familia, the architect. Um, um, Gaudi. Gaudi. Yeah. Antonio Gaudi, where it's like, you know, I don't necessarily like his approach to architecture, but it's so consistent and perfect in him and, and integrated within itself that it's almost amazing. It's that there's something to be gotten out of just appreciating mm -hmm. how fully realized it is. That's I want to add one. Oh. See somebody else's world. Maritza had something. Maritza. Just very quickly, um, you know, Ayn Rand tells us that the style in art, it's one of the most complex, complex aspects of art. And she actually points to Salvador Dali to show to us that it's a shining example of the immense and intense internal conflicts of our um, internal beings. So she views that as a way of showing an ideal, just not you know the whole, but of the internal conflict aspect of our ideal. Uh, excellent. Just following up on that, I mean, what she's uh, specifically she says about Dali is that she admires Dali a great deal for for his epistemology. You know, she she says that she has he has a brilliant epistemology uh, of a superlative clarity. So she admires the epistemology, but she doesn't like the metaphysics. So uh, I think that's that's another kind of level of complexity about art. So there is epistemology, which is kind of reflected in the style. And then there is the subject, you know, what are you saying, which has to do with what your view of the world is. Uh, next up is going to be Kevin, David, uh, Kevin and David. Kevin, go ahead. 
Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I didn't read the book yet. Um, my question is uh, about uh, R in acetico. Uh, the Charlie like ha Habdu has some controversy cartoon on the political or uh, culture religion. So uh, my question for the panelists: What's a, uh, what opinions do you have for artists using humor in their product? Thank you. Mm -hmm. This one seems like it should be yours. Okay. Political cartoons? Well, I have I have published political cartoons. Yeah. I used to publish. Yeah, Charlie Habdu. Yeah. Um, I mean, humor humor has a huge amount of value. I think that uh, you know, people there's a soul sort of canard. There's no humor in Ayn Rand's novels. It's like, no, you don't think there's humor there because the jokes are at your expense. <laughs> uh, <laughs> at least I find that the case with, with leftists say that. I said that, you know, it's because it's because the jokes are at your expense and jokes that are at your expense are always less funny. Um, but, uh, you know, humor is used as a way of sort of highlighting contradictions and of, of making, can make some very pungent points. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and what exactly humor is, is a, I, I, that's an opening account of words. I got theories on this, but um, I don't know that I don't want to get too much into that right now, but then maybe we follow up on a later meeting. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I think humor is a great example of the style. Like, you know, people like Oscar Wilde or Voltaire, you know, they have, I mean, you can see the brilliance of their mind. And so their epistemology is reflected very powerfully uh, in, in the humor. Uh, next up is uh, David. David, go ahead. Okay, David well, Miller. yes, um, well, let me be the, uh, the devil's advocate uh, and uh, put the uh, subjectivist as opposed to the objectivist viewpoint and taking on the issue that Joseph raised, um, the subjectivist viewpoint would be that reason is the slave of the passions. So uh, in our consciousness, we have uh, objective cognoscive elements. So David, and... uh, please go ahead and make the point, but just make it briefly because we want to, we are, we're trying to cover. Okay, right, we'll yes. To, uh, breakout rooms, go ahead. So organizing those objective cognoscive elements, we get end up with science. If, on the other hand, we organize the affective, emotional elements of our consciousness, we end up with art. Mm. So, okay, that's enough. Um, I think this will be a teaser as we work through her chapters um, that lots of people assume that art by its very nature is subjectivist. I think better definition would be that it's personal. It doesn't, and she'll show you in this book, it doesn't, it, and she's really the first that does put reason behind your reactions to art. Um, and before that, everyone, I probably shouldn't say everyone, uh, most theorists about aesthetics before that have referred to it in a subjectivist term, but really she's showing that it's really, it's more personal, not necessarily subjectivist. Well, and one of her main thing points she makes is the personal does not mean the subjective. Something that a personal meaning to without being subjective. Um, and yeah, we're gonna be del delving straight into this in chapter one, where she, we're going into her, what she called psychoepistemology, where she's gonna to be totally going into her theory about the role and origin of emotions, so. Um, we'll get into it more, David. Yeah, we're, we're going to be going we, yeah. Uh, perfect. Um, next up is uh, Jonathan, and then we're going to do, Jonathan, quick question from you, and then we're going to go into breakout rooms. Go ahead. Yeah, okay, cool. I hope it's a quick question. Thank you. By the way, I didn't say thanks. I, I really enjoyed the discussion as well. Um, so you. my question, <laughs> my question is, um, with the inspiration that someone receives from art, what you know, when I think inspiration or when I think motivation, I think inspiration is perishable. That's a quote that I've heard. And so what is it that you get from this kind of or romantic art that motivates you? And 
I'm trying to trace an actual consequence in action. Like, is it also something that is it different in any way from inspiration you might get from meeting a great person or for drinking a good coffee in the morning? And like, what is that difference? I would say absolutely. And um, now I am a huge coffee addict and, you know, coffee is life in the morning. At least, you know, it's what revs up the engines and gets me thinking. However, that is a very subjective thought for me. If I'm, so that the distinction there of, you know, having my fresh coffee, full beans that I grind and I make in a percolator and then you have that perfection of a coffee. That is still different from romantic art because while the coffee is fueling me just, you know, so I can go through the day subjectively, a, a piece of art that is romantic in nature from, we're looking at Ayn Rand's perspective, yes? It's actually speaking to something within me that I may not have necessarily understood existed in me. And what it's saying is strive to be there. You, you can maybe get there. This exists, this is better then it's better in coffee. Why? Because coffee just is. Romantic art says this could be, this ought to be. Excellent. So on that um, note, uh, yes, yeah, sure. No, I got to add to that. That was great, Marissa. Um, I think another step from that is coffee is a sensual pleasure, is um, inspiration to your body um, and wakes up your mind. <laughs> But art, if you like coffee, if you don't like coffee, then it's the opposite. <laughs> art, and in a, in, if it's art that really matches your sense of life, it can give you fuel for your soul. And that's a totally different level, a totally different uh, level of impact because it's far la lasts far longer than caffeine. 